Well, hi, everyone. Welcome today. Really excited to be with you. This is Bronson from Nighthawk Equity. I'm here with the one and only Michael Blanc. Welcome, Michael. What's going on, and Bronson? <laughs> awesome. We're, today, we're going to talk. We get a lot of questions from investors just wanting to know how are multifamily deals structured. So we're going to get into that today. Um, can you talk a little bit about the legal entity that's used to structure a multifamily syndicated deal? Yeah, this one's the easy one, Bronson. Thank you for starting off like that. So typically, I would say all of our deals are just LLCs, limited liability companies. Uh, and sometimes it, uh, we, we may create multiple entities. So we may have a holding company, and then we may have, uh, and that's registered typically in the Texas or Delaware or something like that. Uh, and that's the entity that is the big entity where all the investors, how the operating agreement is. And then we may create a local entity that actually owns the building, and that's in whatever state we're buying it in. And then the holding company then wholly owns that 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 local LLC. But typically there are other structures, uh, but almost everyone uses LLCs, and that's kind of what we use as well. Awesome, thanks for answering that. Um, so a question that also comes up is, you know, what are equity splits, and what are common equity splits that we do at Nighthawk? So an equity split meaning that there's a limited partners, the investors, and then the general partners or GPs, which are the operators or the co-sponsors or things of that nature, right? So typically there's a split. Uh, typical splits, it, it really, there's, there's, the splits are really all over the place, but typically when a syndication is done, let's say 70% of the, of the ownership of the property goes to the limited partners, the LPs, and therefore 30% go to the GPs. Now we see splits all over the place. It can be 60-40, that could be 80-20. Somewhere in that range typically is where we see the splits. Um, and so that, that general partner, uh, part of the equity is called carried interest. So there's a carried interest meaning that the general partners get equity in the deal for putting the deal together, uh, even though the investors put up 100% um, of, the, of the money for that deal. So that's, that's very, very common in a syndication. And I think my advice for investors is don't focus too much on the splits. The thing that's really important, aside from the operator and the deal itself, is the returns, specifically the cash on cash return and the overall or average annual return on a deal. I find that some investors are sometimes get caught up on the splits and they see like a, a 60 40 or 70 30 split and like, oh, the general partners are they're greedy, they're paying themselves too much. Yeah, but you're making a 15, 17% average annual return, right? So keep your eye on the ball. Don't get too distracted with the equity splits. I mean, they, they need to be in line, of course, but what's really most important is, uh, is the, uh, the quality of the operator, the quality of the deal, how conservative the underwriting or the assumptions are, and then what the returns are. The equity splits are really secondary. So some deals have a preferred return and uh, some do not. Can you talk about like what a preferred return is and how it works? Yeah, good, good question. Preferred return is a, is, is a little bit of a mysterious thing. So let me explain what a preferred return is and then I'll give you my opinion, Bronson, since you, since you asked. But preferred return is it's a, it's a certain minimum of cash flow that is paid out to investors before the general partner is paid. So one way to think about this is more like an interest payment. So, which is kind of paid out first, like an interest payment before the cash flow is split based on the split we just talked about. So let's, let's do a quick example. Let's assume a particular syndication is a 70-30 split. So 70 going to the uh, limited partners and 30 going to the general partners. Let's assume that the total cash investment from the investors is $100,000. And it's just to keep the numbers simple. And the preferred return is 5%. So that means that the first 5% of $100,000 or $5,000 is paid out first to the investors, and then whatever's left over is then split 70-30. Does that make sense, Bronson, so far? Yeah, that, that makes sense. All right, so let's assume that the total, in, in one year, the total available cash flow is $15,000. So $15,000 is available for cash flow, and so the first five of that is paid out to the investors, right? And so that leaves a net of 10,000. So of this remaining, this 10,000 cash flow, the investors would receive 70% of that or 7,000. So the investor gets 5,000 out of the preferred and 7,000 from the equity split. So they get a $12,000 total payout for a 12% cash on cash return. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's basically the investors get paid first uh, for right. the money that's available. Mm -hmm. So this sounds pretty good, but here's why I don't like it. And here's why I don't like it, not just from the general partner's perspective, but I don't like it from the limited partner either. So here's the scenario. 
let's say the project doesn't go as planned and sometimes this happens maybe there's a, a slow start uh, the, the 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 units aren't being turned over the property manager is struggling whatever the case you get a slow start and what happens there is there's a not enough cash flow to fund the uh the preferred return so what happens is if i can't fund the preferred return it starts to accrue into the next year typically that's the way it's, it's done so if i can't make that five thousand there's no cash flow i can't pay the five thousand preferred it then gets tacked on year two now let's say year two i'm starting to pick up a little bit more and i'm, I'm starting to now get more towards my pro forma but i've had a delay and now now instead of having uh you know my fifteen thousand dollars in anticipated cash flow i may be at 3,000. I'm already doing better. And, and year three, we're going to be good, maybe. But now I have 3,000, which means I'm going to fall short of that second year, which means that 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 shortfall is now accrued to the third year. You see the trend to see what's going on. And so what happens is after a while, several things can happen, but the general partner realizes that they can never catch up. And they're working for free, right? And after a while, after working for free for two, three, four, whatever years, the general partners might decide, bag it, you know, screw it. I, I have a non-recourse note. I'm just going to let it go and the bank can take it over and I'll just part ways with it. Or I don't know how likely that is, but it could. It certainly would potentially influence the motivation of the general partners to really bust their butt. Or what they could do, they could say, look, I'm not going to get paid until I sell this thing for a profit and then from the profit i can then make up the deficiency and hopefully put money in my pocket so what i might do in, in a situation like this i might decide to sell early i might just say i'm going to sell this thing in year three because if i don't sell it in year three i'm not going to make money for the next five six seven years that doesn't that doesn't really appeal to me so what i'm saying is the existence of a preferred return in a situation where the project doesn't go quite as planned is going to make the operator behave in a way that is not aligned with the best interest of the entire partnership. This, therefore, leads me to the conclusion that a preferred return puts the limited partners not on the same page as the general partners. And I think that's a problem. In general, I'm thinking if we're making a lot of money, everyone's getting paid. If we're not making any money, well, no one should get paid, really. And what I'm seeing is, and this is a trend going on right now, a lot of my peers... Not, I would say of the syndications, about half of preferred and half don't do not. And I'm observing that the people who have had preferred in the past are trying to get out of those preferreds before the reasons I just mentioned. And so you're going to see a lot of people coming up with creative ways to slice the equity pie to wean their investors off this preferred return for this exact reason that I'm just mentioning. This is why I don't like preferreds and we have never done them before. And this comes up a lot on calls where just the idea of really aligning the, the interests of the syndicator and the investor together, because it's really about creating that relationship where we can all have win-win for a long period of time. So I think that's really great. Um, talk to us for a minute about voting and control and kind of what does it mean to have control in a deal and what are voting rights and passive investors? How does that work in relation to, there's kind of a couple questions there, but how does that work with vote, voting and control? Yeah, so control and voting rights. So the nature of being a limited partner is that you are limited. And this means that you're limited in liability. And the reason that the SEC gives you uh, limited, limited liability means you can only lose your principal of money you invested. You can't lose anything more than that. Meaning, imagine there's a, a total loss of the building. That means that the bank can't go after the limited partners. Also, if there's a lawsuit, for example, they can't go after the limited partners. In order to protect the limited partners this way, they have to have limited day-to-day -day operational control, right? So the law says, hey, you're not really driving the ship. So if the ship runs aground, it's actually not your fault. So I'm going to protect you from that. So it's a good, bad thing, right? The bad thing is that I don't really control the ship. <laughs> the good thing is that I'm, I'm limited from the exposure that we have right there. So the, the, the document that governs that is the operating agreement. So when you invest in a syndication, the operating agreement outlines the rights that the limited partners have and the rights that the general partners have. Generally, the general partners have make day-to-day -day decisions, including things like when they sell or refinance and things of that nature. And limited partners uh, typically have to vote on anything that reduces their voting rights or their equity rights in any way. So typically, that's how these deals are structured. Awesome. So one question that comes up is, you know, investors ask is, when do I get my money back? If I'm going to invest 50K or 100K or 200K, when do I get my money back? How would you answer that? 
Yeah, so there's different ways that you can get your money back, and, and that is uh, a, a, what, what are called liquidity events. So liquidity event is either a refinance, a cash out refinance, or an actual sale. So let's take this example of, you know, we had this 321 unit in Memphis, as you know, in Country, Country View, and we buy it for $7 million. We put a million dollars into it. So we're into it for $7 million. And then 13 months later, we get it refinanced at a $15 million valuation, which is really cool. And we love these kinds of deals. What's even cooler about it is the investors then through the refinance covers the preceding loan as well as the majority of the initial investment, the equity. So we were able to return 84% of the initial investment back. And so that is a, I, we get the majority of our money back, which is really cool for two reasons for the investor. One, the majority of the risk is off the table. So if for some reason this thing gets run into the ground, which it won't, but let's say it did, they already have their money back. But number two, they get their money back and they get to invest it again in another deal. So now they're getting a return on the first 100000 or whatever. They get their money back and now they can invest the same $100,000 in another deal and get a return off that. And let's say we do another refinance two years later and they get their money back. So they can turn that same money over two or three times and getting a return each time. Uh, and so the... That's awesome, right? You get a huge cash and cash return on that same amount of money that you're rolling over. And so the other event that you get your money back could be at the sale of the property, which typically is depending on the property five to 10 years after it's sold. And that is normally part of the business plan. So when you invest in its indication, uh, the plan typically says this is a five year hold or a seven year hold or a 10 year hold. We expect to have a refinance or we expect not to have a refinance. So that should all be part of the plan. And good operators should then honor those commitments. So if we say, hey, we're going to sell this thing in year five, well, shoot, we should sell this in year five. And unless there's some unforeseen circumstance. Uh, maybe there's a market correction and like I can't sell or it shouldn't, we shouldn't sell, we should wait another year. Then that's something that we can decide. Uh, and sometimes, you know, if we're going to change our business plan, what I would do is I would pull the limited partners. Hey, what do you guys want to do? We can do whatever we want because we're driving the ship. But at the end, if the, if the majority of our investors want something, then why am I going to resist that, right? I need to honor my initial commitment. And if I'm going to change the plan, they should, they should provide input. So that's kind of my philosophy on it. Absolutely. I love that you brought up the idea of infinite returns. That's what we call that, where when there's a refinance, people get all their money back and yet stay invested in a deal. So if some question comes up that we don't buy people out of a deal when they get you know, money back, it's actually people stay invested in the deal for the life of the deal. Um, talk to us for a minute about the different sponsor fees involved in a syndicated deal and which, what each of those are. Yeah. So when you see a deal, um, you may see different fees. You know, like, what are these fees? There's, there's really five fees that you could see. Now, typically, you don't see all five of them. That would be a little unusual, but you might see some uh, and maybe not others. But here are the five, and I'll tell you which ones are more common, which ones are not, and what to expect. The most common is the acquisition fee. The acquisition fee is something that's payable to the general partners at closing, and it's typically 3% of the purchase price. Now, sometimes it could be a little lower. Sometimes it could be a little higher. Uh, sometimes there may be a development fee in addition. So, for example, if, it's a, if it involves heavy construction, you could see an acquisition fee of say two percent and another two percent development fee. So the acquisition fee would be per would be payable at closing, and another two percent would be payable when the construction is complete. You see it a lot on really heavy value add or ground up construction. The reason being that these are very important milestones in the project. Uh, having completed construction is a very important milestone, and so it's essentially a success fee. Um, the other uh, most common fee is an asset management fee. So this is payable typically as a percentage of gross collected rents, kind of like a property manager, right? And so it's typically one and a half, around one and a half percent, could be a little less, could be a little more of gross collected rents, meaning that the more rents are collected, the higher the fee. If, the, if it's lower, the lower the fee becomes. And, and both of those typically are used to, um, to manage the asset because managing an asset, especially when you do it in a larger portfolio, you know, like ours, we actually have overhead expenses. And, and so these fees are used to pay people to manage the asset and things of that nature. So those are the most common fees. There's a couple other ones uh, that you might see. It's a capital transaction fee, which is payable when, the, when there's a cash out refinance and it returns 100% of the principal. Again, it's a major important milestone. 
and a success milestone. And so there could be a 1% capital transaction fee when that happens. And there could be what's called a disposition fee when the property is eventually sold. And it could be a percent of the sales price. So those are some of the, the fees that you see. Again, it's a little unusual to see all of them. If you see all of them, you might want to ask a question. Uh, but again, you know, if the fees are reasonable and the returns are there, the underwriting is conservative, you have a strong operator, don't get too bent out of shape on the, of the fees, right? Because the operators actually do have overhead. We actually do have salary. We have offices and things of that nature that need to be paid. So uh, really, typically, the operators make their money on the equity. And the only way an operator really makes true money is if we raise the value of that, right? So these fees, while they could be annoying, uh, really are there to pay our bills. Absolutely. Michael, thanks for taking a few minutes to chat about this, about how deals are structured. I think it's a lot of value to all of us listening. And uh, for those that are listening right now, if you haven't joined uh, NighthawkEquity.com, you can click the join button. You can hear about upcoming deals uh, that we're really, we're really excited about. So look forward to seeing you on the next video. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. Now, as the next step, download this ebook right here. Okay. When you've downloaded that, uh, make sure you also subscribe to my YouTube channel because then you can get all of the videos that I release as soon as I release. So make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel right now. Click on that right now. And then also make sure that this is the next best video to watch is this one right here. So hope you enjoy that. I'll catch you next time.